Hi there, you guys. Great to have you round here and welcome to a delayed Holy Shed. Delayed, of course, because me and the lovely Pat were at Greenbelt last weekend. And uh, despite my enormous optimism with the best one in the world, I was never going to fit in doing a Holy Shed. If you went there, by the way, Greenbelt had the most magnificent 50th anniversary, possibly the best festival yet for me. Uh, and I first went to Greenbelt back in 1978 to take uh, along a very raw and exciting rock band called Giant Killer, who were part of my flock at the time, to play on the main stage. They went down such a storm that they were booked to return the following year. And this time we went to the festival as a family. And uh, me and the missus pretty much have carried on going ever since. And now I'm even part of the establishment. <laughs> a responsible trustee. Well, maybe not too responsible. Over the years, I have given talks, do you know, at a whole pile of different mainstream Christian events in this country and abroad. But I have to tell you this, Greenbelt is the only one I have ever paid for me uh, and my family to go to. The only one I've ever felt like paying to attend. Because, I don't know, lots of things, but different to other Christian gigs, Greenbelt has forged this incredible path of hosting all manner of speakers and artists, often not Christians, even atheists like Richard Dawkins, who was there last year. And I don't know anywhere else in a so-called Christian context where you'd be able to have the kind of conversations and experiences of such a diverse uh, bunch of uh, contributors. Artists who've performed at the festival over the years include U2, Moby, I remember that one, Tom Robinson, Sinead O'Connor, bless her heart, Pussy Riot, the, uh, the lesbian band from uh, Russia who've been imprisoned by Putin uh, uh, along the way, Michael Franti, of course, one of my great favourites, Ed Sheeran, I hadn't realised that till just this week, that Ed Sheeran played the festival, I miss that completely. The Proclaimers, you know, with 500 more miles to go. Uh, so many others that I could mention. This year, um, contributors included Brian Eno, Gordon Brown, the former Prime Minister, Yasmin Alibi Brown, the journalist, Jack Monroe. Wow, that was an amazing session. Uh, Sadia Azmat, the Muslim comedian. Uh, oh, and me. <laughs> anyway. Pat suggested I do a, a shed based on my talk, which was called Blessed of the Giver Shits. Well, I'm not too sure because the actual talk is going to be available to listen to online sometime quite soon. But, you know, if you guys want me to do it here in the shed, I'd be very happy to do that. But today, just a shortish shed based on two quotes that I gave in my Greenbelt talk. One you'll have heard me talking about here before quite recently, I think, and another maybe not. Preparing for Greenbelt this year, I read Nazreen Malik's book, We Need New Stories, challenging the toxic myths behind our age of disconsent, which, discontent, which I found very inspiring. It's a really, really good read. She's a Sudanese-born journalist who's lived in this country for a long, long time. She, she, she was a little girl, I think, uh, who writes regularly for The Guardian. And reflecting on her book, I felt confirmed in my belief that we stand right now at a critical point, both in the church and in wider society here in this country and elsewhere. It's um, a point, I think, at which we have a choice to make about the future between nostalgia and imagination, which brings me to the first quote by the philosopher and social commentator Stephen Toulmin, who in the late 1990s wrote a book called Cosmopolis, I think it was called, which was looking, peering forward into the new millennium. And, and he said just this, he said, we have a choice between two attitudes toward the future. It's a choice, he said, between imagination and nostalgia, a choice between facing the future and backing into it. Well, that's an interesting quote, and I love the idea of, <laughs> well, I love the image of backing into the future, because it's saying, really, we're going in the future one way or another, guys. You know, you can either face it courageously and imaginatively and be part of shaping it, or back into it nostalgically, grabbing 
uh, keeping hold on as best you can the past. Um, I actually sense nostalgia in different ways in both the church and society. In the United States, uh, Donald Trump is, I think, paradigmatic of the uh, you know of of this nostalgic thing with his famous strapline, "Make America Great Again," and um, I think that clearly begs the question: When was America great? Uh, what does it even mean to be great? And who was it great for? Who wasn't it great for? But then that's how nostalgia tends to work. It distorts memories by transforming the past into something that it never really was, which happens to suit us and our kind. Uh, in a similar fashion here in the UK, some people long to see the, uh, the great reinserted into Great Britain. And populist politics plays on this and, and on the whole Little England mentality. And a similar psychology exists in other parts of Europe and, and elsewhere in the world. It seems to be a trend. And sometimes I think that's because, you know, there is a future impacting us already or, or peering over the horizon that is scary and, you know, threatening and we feel insecure. And so we want to run for the hills. We want to go back to what we feel, even though it's a fantasy very often, um, a, a, a past which, uh, which, which is more controllable and more certain, obviously, than the future that is appearing up ahead. What's important for those of us who react against these populist trends is, I think, to resist demonising people for feeling nostalgic for some golden age in the past. More important is to get beneath the rhetoric and try to hear the concerns and fears that give rise to those kind of sentiments, which I think need to be addressed in more positive ways. Otherwise, uh, it all gets worse and worse and worse. And I can see similar trends in the church. Fundamentalist and a lot of conservative Christianity contends that they are being faithful to the gospel, the past. But fundamentalism, I think, is basically a form of nostalgia. It's trying to grasp and recreate a past which in reality needs to be relinquished uh, or even recognised to be a collective fantasy as we move forward into the future because I can't believe in a gospel which is all about the past. I can't believe in a God, in a Holy Spirit uh, who has nothing more basically to say other than repeating it ad nauseum uh, than what was said 2,000 years ago. That, that's just not right to me. I think the whole of the Bible, which is used as the basis for this nostalgia very often, um, projects before us when you read it, uh, you know, openly, um, a pattern of an unfolding picture. And um, I don't think it was ever meant that the picture actually was finished, you know, when not even in the New Testament time itself, but, you know, a few hundred late years later when somebody decided that is the New Testament. You know, I, I believe in an ever-evolving, ever-creative uh, world in which God is, um, is, is constantly pushing forwards. For some years, I was a leader in a section of what's called the house church movement, which adopted the label Restoration referring to a belief that the Holy Spirit was restoring the church to its original New Testament patterns of ministry. It was as if, you know, the first burst of the church was its peak and everything's been downhill since and we're now trying to get back to that. And, um, you know, the Restoration Movement, which was itself a kind of religious populism, uh, flourished, I mean, enormously flourished in the 1970s and early 1980s. It was very, it was quite exciting to be a part of it, if, you know, as we were caught up in this sense that, that um, you know, something was being restored. But it was all based on a false impression of a New Testament golden age, which never really existed. In a book of responses, both positive and negative, to my book, The Post-Evangelical, the lovely Maggie Dawn wrote an essay with the brilliant title, 
you have to change to stay the same. In other words, to be true to the originating spirit of a movement, we need to evolve, move forward, progress, allowing the spirit to inspire among us fresh forms and and expressions of divine life, true to where we find ourselves now, instead of simply being a sad facsimile of an imagined past. The interesting thing about Donald Trump's MAGA, you know, Make America Great Again phenomenon, is that it actually combines these two things. It combines a toxic nostalgia, both national and religious, which rewrites history, utterly ignoring the noxious reality of racism, misogyny, homophobia and impoverishment, which are integral to American history, along with all the other sort of, you know, positive things. And and that's pretty much the same in our own history, too. And the reality is that Donald Trump could not have been elected and cannot be elected, God help us, (laughs) in the future, without the massive support of white evangelical Republican Christians who believe that he can be the servant of God despite his devastatingly awful character. Um, He can be the servant of God to restore this nostalgic and completely false self-identification of a, a Christian nation under God. But as far as I can see, all religious fundamentalism, Christian uh, or, or other religions too, amounts to a form of nostalgia for a lost past, which probably never existed in the way that it's imagined. Because of the noise generated, it's very easy to be intimidated by regressive, nostalgic, populist politics or religion. But I believe this noise is actually the expression of dying cultures, secular and religious. The world actually, and this is very powerfully put across in the book I mentioned uh, by Nazrin Malik, um, it's actually the expression of dying cultures. And uh, the world, as she says, is much more progressive now, uh, thank God, and increasingly so among young people, much more progressive, she she argues, than most politicians on either side of the left-right divide, uh, if there indeed is a divide, uh, much more than they believe. And she's arguing that they're playing for this wedge issue that forces them apart, um, and in doing that, rushing toward a kind of populist position, um, which is misjudging the fact that that most people, well, I think she she wrote an article in The Guardian which said something like, you know, the UK is a kinder and less divided society than politicians believe. So uh, I don't believe that the future lies with political or religious fundamentalists uh, or with policies and attitudes of nostalgia. However much they may shout and holler I don't think that that's where the future lies. I think the future does lie with a kinder, more just, more generous and inclusive world. And it's for each of us to lean into, to live into that future in all its fullness. The other quote that I used at Greenbelt is from one of the early German ecologists, Rudolf Barrow, who says this. He says, when the forms of an old culture are dying, the new culture is created by a few people who are not afraid to be insecure. I think that's an incredible quote, which I used actually all those years ago when I wrote the post-evangelical. I used that as, I think it's how I finished the book. When the forms of an old culture are dying, whether that's religious or not, the new culture is created by a few people who are not afraid to be insecure. So you see, guys, we can't change the world on our own. I can't, you can't. But we can change things in our world, in our sphere of influence and activity. One step at a time, we can change things in the world of some people. One act of resistance at a time, we can do it. 
the replacement of bullying coercion with kindness, generosity, one step at a time. It's over to us. That's the way it is. Uh, I don't believe things have to be the way they are. And therefore, I believe with all my heart, I place all my sort of bets on um, a future which is shaped by new imagination rather than by this, you know, stultifying nostalgia for something in the past, which most often is a fantasy anyway. Okay, so I have got a prayer that I thought about um, when I was thinking through these thoughts. I believe in life. I don't believe things have to be the way they are. I don't believe noise and intimidation equal might. I don't believe in being a passive victim, bereft of power, waiting for someone else to step in. I do believe faith, as small as a mustard seed, infuses even the least with courage to move a mountain. I do believe hope is our greatest act of defiance against the culture of pessimism and despair. I do believe love can resist a tsunami of callous intention, open-heartedly reaching out even to an enemy. I believe in future. I believe in imagination. I believe in adventure. I believe in having a reverse gear. I believe in kissing the morning. I believe in singing in the rain. I believe in making new friends I didn't imagine could be my friends. I believe in knowing we have limits. I believe in being insecure as a way of growing strong. I believe in not knowing what to believe, but believing all the same. Why? I believe in life. Well, there you go, guys. That's just about it, really, for this uh, little brief excursion into the Holy Shed. Um, if you like what I'm doing here, you know what to do. Here's the link on the screen before you. And uh, that's really just about it. Um, stay awake to life. Stay awake and alive to people around you. Stay human. And um, I'm going to leave you with... A magnificent quote by Mary Oliver. I'm sure you're aware of it, but it bears further contemplation. See you soon.